Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. Our first scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, beginning with chapter 15, verse 12. Listen now to the Word of God as He speaks to our hearts. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson today comes from Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians. We're beginning in chapter 1, verse 3. Listen now to the word of God. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart for all of you share in God's grace with me both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We gather together. That is the theme of this season that has begun. For some, actually this weekend kicks it off. People are visiting another branch of the family, having a Thanksgiving number one, uh, yesterday or today. And in the days ahead, Uh, Of course, there is the big one on Thursday, but uh, Friday, Saturday, there may be other rounds as well. We gather together. As we gather together, I let my mind play with that phrase. Images came to mind, free association. One actually came from the poster for a movie. I'll tell you later if you're interested in what the movie was, but it's basically a comedy with some serious moments about a group of friends over a series of adventures and gatherings over a block of time. And the poster has the the lead couple toasting each other and saying, here's to our friends and the strength to put up with them. Some of that goes on at this time of year. It may be a little bit touchy this Thanksgiving. My mind goes back to Thanksgiving 1973. I am in the fourth grade. We are at my grandparents' Bennett, and my grandmother said, we will not discuss Watergate at the dinner table. In such a tone of voice that, no, we did not discuss it or even think about it, at least for the meal. For some, this season comes with a guidebook. I have shared this before. Early in our marriage um, with Mary Lee, we're going to a, taking her to a family gathering, and I had written out a, a list of who you expect to see there, a little bit of backstory, and even a little bit of 
Now, there was an incident between two people. We're not going to go there. Don't even get into that territory. It was kind of a new thing for her, but to me, it's second nature. You have a guidebook as to what can and cannot be discussed in certain settings and certain families. A time for us to gather. All those jokes aside, this is a time to remember and to give thanks. The way we have been brought together, celebrating the families into which we've been born, and the networks of which we find ourselves a part. In John's Gospel, Jesus spoke to His disciples, I have chosen you. I have brought you together. Love one another. You are the family. You are a family. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, we hear of his joy over the group that is gathered there. I'm going to look at the passage I read and then some other passages as we continue. Philippians is actually one big thank you note. He is in prison, and the people in Philippi had sent him a gift, and so he writes them a note. And if you can't speak to somebody in person, there are two ways to communicate. Letter writing being the, a primary one. I'll tell you the other one later in the message. But this was a way to keep up with them, to encourage them, to share his heart with them. And that's exactly what he did. He speaks at the beginning, I remember you. I love you all. I remember all that we have done together. I remember and I give thanks. Through this letter, we see three ways of approaching this time of year. This is a time to review and to remember, a time to revisit and reconnect, and a time to reunite and even reconcile, a time to review and remember, to remember and to give thanks. At this time, we think of family members uh, those are present with us and those who have gone before that have had that influence on us. A mother or father or sister, a brother, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. We remember and we give thanks for what they have done for us. But to encourage you to think broader than just the immediate family, think of a mentor that you have had along the ways. Uh, maybe somebody at your first job or someone who coached you through a crossroads in life. This could be someone who's a full generation or two ahead of you, or someone a half generation or just a few years ahead of you in the game of life. You can think of one like a teacher who influenced you, either inspired you to teach or showed you how uh, down the road. You say, I want to be like that person, or even as a student, but even as a new teacher saying, you know, that one down the hall, that teacher's got it going. I want to copy that, that, that playbook of how that teacher is approaching things. Some of us may remember some years back, we had Men's Life here, and uh, we would go through the material, and Robert Lewis was the preacher presenter in it. And he shared about some influences in his life. His family life situation was less than ideal, but he said he got so much out of his football coach. The way that coach had invested in him, encouraged him, said, you can do it. You're a leader. I believe in you. And even he and his wife, they named their firstborn son for that coach. That was a mentor for whom he remembered and gave thanks. And there are people in this church that have inspired you along the way. Over the years, I've heard people here share tales of how um, members of this church were inspirations. Um, somebody sharing as a young mother coming to town. There were a few of the little bit older ladies in the church who uh, you know, kind of guided her getting set up in town. Pediatrician lined up in no time were role models to her. Others have shared stories. I could probably go on to about one o'clock if I repeated all the wonderful stories that I've heard. There are people, as you're thinking now, in this church that have been role models to you. You can remember and give thanks. And then there is that colleague from work or that friend from many years ago or current friend in your life. These are the people that we can review 
of all the good people in our lives, we can, we can remember and give thanks. We can remember and we can give thanks and we can revisit and reconnect. The other way of keeping up in Paul's time besides writing a letter, if you couldn't go there in person, you sent a friend to give all the latest news on you and could get the news from others. And that follows in Philippians. In the second chapter, Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Timothy's worth you know how like a son with a father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. Still, I think it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. At this time, we can uh, revisit and reconnect. As we look back over the people that we re review and remember we think of those we just haven't seen lately. Now, it could be somebody here in town that you do see on a regular basis, but life has taken you all in different directions. Now, it's just a, a quick hello, a smile, a, maybe a short update, but nothing really in depth. And the weeks ahead is a time when you can say, hey, let's get that cup of coffee, or let's make that time to talk on the phone. Let's make that time to catch up. Or it could be someone here in the community, in the end, fairly easy to reach. But again, life has taken you all in different directions, and you're just not seeing each other. The sports schedules, school schedules, uh, various volunteer commitments bring us in different directions. These changes happen. It's a time to reconnect, just like Paul wanted to reconnect with the people there through personal contact, through the personal representatives. It could also be someone who just has moved or life has gone, again, different directions. Uh, just this past week, I had a chance to swap emails with a classmate from seminary. Uh, we graduated and have never been in the same state ever since. Uh, different places. Um, we've crossed paths, I think, three times, maybe four, uh, since graduation. But we do periodically touch base, and we will overdo a connection had a chance to make a phone call with a friend and catch up with him. Um, he's in Colorado. Not sure when I'll get a chance to check, see him face to face, but I can always call, and there's also FaceTime these days. People that are, are distant from us that we don't see regularly one way or the other. This is a time to revisit and to reconnect. But there's a third way that we can respond and celebrate at this time. In some respects, this might be the more challenging. If you look at um, chapter 4 of Philippians, there's the, well, a hint of some troubles in that church. And this was actually a church that was doing very well. Paul had no issues with the people there. He had a little encouragement, and this is some that we find here. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Adia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companions, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, there is some speculation, um, some uh, wondering what is the issue between the two women there. They are at odds with one another, but we don't know anything beyond that. But it's clear that they have labored with Paul. They have prayed with Paul. 
They've eaten with Paul. They ate and prayed together and with other people. They are among this leadership team at that church. And for whatever reason, they are at odds with one another. This is a time as we review and remember, we can see where we need to reunite and reconcile. Now, I'll be the first to admit, this is always a tough challenge or section for me to cover. And I've shared before, you know, in the Dalton family, we have so many grudges, we have to build a storage shed in the, in the, in the backyard to carry them. We fill the attic. One time someone said, Jones, I think you just forgive somebody to create more space. You got a new grudge. You got to push out an old one. <laughs> so you do that. You know, we don't have a, a, a dirty list. We've got a dirty book, and it's about the size of Gone with the Wind. Or as my uncle, Sam, shared in a gathering early in his marriage to my aunt, as he was again given the same list, that kind of list that Mary Lee got, and he summarized it this way, there are in Downtons and out Downtons, and Downtons you don't talk about around other Downtons. So, I, I know my stuff, I know my issues, <laughs> and so I, I, I come to this with some fear and trembling. But this is a time, a season, which actually gives us a good reason to reunite and to reconcile. For some cases, the issue, whatever it is or whatever it was, is it's water under the bridge. Whatever divided you in the past is past, old history. But now you're saying, how do you reconnect? For some, it's a work in progress. It's not as bad as it was, but it still hurts a bit, still not easy to talk about. And for some, in some cases, the wounds are still too fresh, and the issue is still too much at the surface. In these situations, all of these three, how do you respond? In some cases, this is as simple as a card, a note. It's, it's Thanksgiving. Christmas is around the corner. Always a good reason to drop somebody a note. I'm thinking about you, sharing a pleasant memory. For those where the waters, you know, passed, that may be a good way to begin to build a new bridge. How to go about it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit prompts us, and the love of Jesus compels us to begin to make that step for those maybe in that middle range. Um, I've shared this one before about uh, someone with whom I was at odds, not in this community, so don't do a roll call as I de describe the situation, but I, I was at odds. And I'd even tried with, with Gus, I thought earlier, I'm trying to kind of get through to you. And it seemed like he just did not get it. Well, a mutual connection said, now Gus avoids conflict. You have to basically hold his face, look him in the eye, and say, we're not good. And so, I did that. I didn't touch his face. Don't worry about that. But figuratively speaking, I got in his face and just said, we're not good. And I want to be good with you. What do we need to do to get good? And again, because I kind of held his face and looked him in the eye, he was like, oh, okay, let's get together. And so we did. Talked about the past issue. Um, and again, I it was kind of middle phase with it. Got some things cleared, understood from where he was coming on the situation, and pretty much resolved it. Still, periodically, we're touching base. Out of town, so it's one of those phone call, email situations. Uh, but we're able to do that. The Holy Spirit had been tugging at me for some time. That this is time to make that step. And the Spirit made the path clear. For some situations... At this season, it's simply you make a commitment to pray, to pray about the person and to pray about the situation and to let the Holy Spirit work in its own good time. Some years ago, a uh, situation, uh, again, a, a negative, another one of my negatives, and it was at a conference, and I heard the speaker talk about bringing God into the negative and different ways that you bring God into the negative you know, bring God into the negative, releasing His power to work. 
And I thought, reflected on the situation, and I said, well, I can at least pray about it, and I will. And I made that commitment to pray, a little um, maybe Holy Spirit twisting the arm, but nevertheless made that commitment. And over time, began to see some changes, movement. Now, I think it was half a millimeter at a time. But over time, began to see some warming to the situation. And it was like two years later, I was in a position to be able to speak about it. Sometimes it's the time, you simply have to pray in any of these situations, Lord, where is there a door to open? And when it opens, give me the eyes to see. Let me walk through it. Walk with me, Lord, through that. Please, please Lord, give me that courage to take that step. This is a time when we can review and remember, reconnect and revisit, and reunite and reconcile. We gather together with topics off the table and an approved list of topics that are on the table. We gather together, and here's our friends and the strength to put up with them. We gather together with a guidebook and a playbook. That's one way of approaching the season. Or we gather together to give thanks for the people that God has placed in our lives and the people God places in our lives today. We review and we remember and we give thanks. We revisit and we reconnect, and we give thanks. And with an extra boost from Jesus Christ Himself, we reunite and we reconcile by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And in all of this, we give thanks. Amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.